Good morning. Welcome to the CES meeting today, June 29th and, uh, of 2022. And today we're here to talk about a couple of topics, one of which is getting the champions of compartments who are somewhat represented well at this call generally um, up to speed with what's been going on with building out consensus with other folks and stakeholders, et cetera. And uh, especially among champions, Carity, uh, welcome. Um, Carity is has ha, is and has been a champion of the compartments proposal for uh, uh, with with a great deal of continuity going all the way back to the original conversations about ESM at TC thirty nine, um, and uh, and we've been trying to get back into uh, back in touch over the last few days. Carity has a few motivating concerns to talk about for the compartments proposal toward making it more streamlined toward building consensus at TC39. But let's start off with a couple of uh, procedural things, one of which is that I've made a few pull requests against the compartments proposal, and I am not yet confident since I haven't talked to the champions as a group about what we want to do about when to land things in, in the proposal and what, what, amount of, uh, what amount of consensus is sufficient in order to land things in the compartment proposal proper. My, um, I throw out a proposal. I think that it should be sufficient for um, I, the one. It isn't a great solution, but it is a possible solution that we review pull requests together at this meeting. And if there are no objections, land things. And of course, because the compartments proposal is still stage one, Unchanging things is relatively easy if that turns out to if if we manage to land something that we don't have full consensus on. Um, let me propose. I like I like in general that rule, but let me propose a slight modification to it. Uh, Monopole is not always at these meetings. Um, uh, before making a semantic change to the compartment proposal, uh, I really want to get feedback uh, from Monopole as well. Uh, that can be either before or after the uh, you know the meeting itself. Um, yeah, um, toward that end, if I, I know that it's hard to get Patrick at these meetings, but can we? Uh, well, I will send an email to Patrick from Audible um, asking um, like what kind of cadence and what kind of uh, um, how 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 best to get his stamp. Um, on on any change that lands in the compartments proposal, and then go from there. Yeah, I mean a, a review of a GitHub PR. Um, you know, just if Pat Patrick does a review, if you know, Peter or Patrick does a review and approves it, that's certainly you know yeah. fine with me. They don't have to be at the meeting in order for the PR to go forward. Yeah, I I would say that any like any change requested or stamp on a PR, I would take as a signal. But in the absence of that. Um, that uh, in order to keep things moving, maybe we make, maybe we review together at these meetings. But that being said, Patrick in particular, I want to make sure we keep in the loop. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, Patrick and I were actually talking about this um, earlier this week that we uh, we we think it's really important that we keep up to date with the proposals, both both in what's being proposed, but also trying to keep the implementation fairly up to date with that because I think. A lot of the insights that uh, that have come out um, are a result of that kind of hands-on experience of, of actually trying to make this stuff work. Um, I don't see in general a problem with that. If you guys tag um, Patrick, uh, Patrick and I on a on a you know on the PR, um, then we can we can between us make sure that somebody somebody takes a look or is is here. I don't think that should be too difficult. Okay. Um, so tagging Patrick and you on every PR is, is perfectly fine for me. Um, there are a lot of other champions. Do other champions wish to be tagged on every PR? Some PRs are fairly incremental uh, and some PRs are more revolutionary. Um, I, I want to be tagged on all the revolutionary ones. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Carity, how do you feel? About the PRs? 
Yeah. Like how, what, what kind of process do you, uh, do you, since there is a large number of champions, do you wish to be included on the people who are tagged on every pull request? Uh, I, uh, I declare bankruptcy on uh, GitHub notification. So uh, it doesn't matter if I'm CC there or not. It's, yeah. Uh, so I, it's, it's hard for okay. me. So, okay. So, so, uh, Thankfully, we now have a way to communicate with each other out of band. I will, instead of or in addition to tagging you on PRs, be sure to send you links in chat <laughs> in order to make sure that you get your attention. All right. <coughs> okay. Um, all right. I'm gonna. I let, let's let's go with that. I will let let's um, let's use the pull request mechanism, the workflow, as the way of getting sign off for any change. I will want to see stamps from Carity, Mark, and someone from Audible, um, at least. Um, and I'll go look over the list of champions to make sure that we've got everybody covered. Oh, yes. And I intend to issue a pull request soon to move Bradley and JF to an emeritus champion group um, to, one, honor their contributions, and to not require their stamps going forward, since I know Bradley uh, wishes to detach from OSS for uh, 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 since he's moved on. And, um, and JF, I don't think that any of us are in touch with anymore. Um, yeah, so, so you can look forward to a pull request for that and let me know if there are any objections. Um, the, okay, so that being said, let's take a look at the pull requests right now together so that I can give context to each of them and then independently um, uh, uh, let's let's take a, a look at them separately. Um, and first, um, an overview that I intend to give next week and uh, barring um, considerable revision to these slides before then. Uh, this is a slide I'm, uh, I intend to present uh, next week on, at, on Wednesday at 10 a.m. at the Module Harmony meeting that will replace this meeting just next week. Um, this is a sort of overview of like a, tr a, a trivialized web implementation of a compartment, a, a virtualizing a, a web module loader using compartments. Um, and I say trivialized because it doesn't take into account import maps or scopes or anything like that. So that, that allows us to have a very simple resolve hook, which is to say that in this compartment, URLs are referrer specifiers um, and import specifiers are also URLs, but may be relative. Um, and then the load hook is just going to use fetch. This redirect manual is meaningless. Um, the uh, and then if whoop, well, how do how do how does keynote work or <laughs> slides how do slides work? So uh, you fetch the text. If it's a redirect, you return a module descriptor indicating that it is a redirect and that you should use the uh, an instance with a different full specifier. Um, and then await the response text to get the source. Construct a static module record from the source and provide an import meta that includes the response URL, not the request URL. Uh, uh, in actually, if this, if this gets respected, those will be one and the same. Um, and, uh, and then by, by way of demonstration that you kick it off by saying compartment import, and then the fully qualified URL of the module you want to import. So that's how compartments work in a nutshell. And then all of the different motivating use cases are variations on the theme of this code. Uh, one of the variations on the theme is you have a different resolver. Um, another variation is, hey, we're doing a bundler. We don't want to actually execute. We just want to load, in which case this import becomes load. And then we add some code around here to capture all of the sources that we loaded so we can stuff them in a bundle. Um, and also in that notion, um, the load hook would presumably be using, uh, we could even be using the web hooks again, but uh, uh, the, 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 the referrer namespace would be, um, that, that's constructed would be relative to the, would be relative to the root of the, the bundle. Um, so basically erasing the URL namespace and replacing it with a path oriented namespace or just relative URLs. So that, that's sort of the flavor of 
all of the motivating use cases. Oh, and of course, the other half of that is rehydrating a bundle means also creating a compartment, but this one has a load hook that instead of using fetch, just grabs the sources from a map. Um, so high level API for compartment is that it at least implements load and import with full specifiers. Load being the, hey, get all of the sources, but don't execute them. Import being, hey, if you have the sources already, go ahead and continue to use them. But if you don't have them, also load them and then execute them. Um, and then the compartment constructor options are the resolve hook, the load hook, and uh, a modules array that primes the compartment with things that don't need to be loaded because they've already been loaded. Um, uh, right, and then also uh, with the most recent revelations, having worked with XS and Modable on this, is that there is a module descriptor that is a common type used by both the return type of the load spec and the modules thing, such that a whole bunch of other things are orthogonal and a couple of methods got to disappear from the specification. Um, then uh, module descriptors have, I, I, I hesitated in this slide to say exactly what the syntax should be because I think that that is in, inadequate as specified and probably the area of greatest risk and needing to iterate on with Modable, especially in order to get an implementation that covers all of the bases and doesn't cover any bases that are unnecessary. Um, and this is also, I think, uh, one of the areas of greatest risk from Carity's perspective, like because this is one of those things that could be omitted from the specification under certain circumstances if we made a pivot in the design, um, which we'll talk about later. But in any case, the things that need to be accounted for, regardless of whether they're accounted for with module descriptors, are being able to link to a static module record that hasn't necessarily been executed and associating it with metadata, um, creating a virtual static module record, which is to say for a non-ECMAScript module, get, basically create a representation of the source of something that isn't JavaScript that can be linked into a JavaScript module graph. Um, that's read that as JSON, WASM, language that hasn't been invented yet. Can I, can I suggest a term rotation? Sure. Uh, that that should simply be called a static module record. And that the other thing, if it's made from JavaScript sources, it should be called a, a static source module record. That's a, that's a good point. Um, the terminology, uh, and that's a great suggestion especially for the internal spec names for these things. Um, I, I think Carity and I, having iterated on this a bit, have um, gotten toward probably more ergonomic public names for what gets reified into JavaScript, if, uh, if so. At the, and we can talk about that in, um, in when we go over pull requests, and I will make more pull requests to that effect. Um, uh, so an alias is to say uh, this: the, we need a, compartments need to be able to virtualize the existing host behavior. That if inside a compartment, multiple full specifiers can ultimately refer to refer to the same instance. Um, the reason for this is that aliases exist in Node, among other things. Where, for example, you might import the main module of a package. And the main module of the package refers to a specific concrete module within the package, and those have different names. Um, so uh, we need an accommodation for internal aliases within a compartment. We also need, for the case where there are multiple compartments, they say the case where there's a compartment representing each package in a node module graph or each scope in an import map um, that uh, within a certain scope in an import map, map or a package within node, it needs to be possible to link to a module in another compartment. Um, and so we need a, a way to express that. We need to be able to name the static module record as loaded by the host compartment and, uh, and create a new instance of it. Um, and that is, this is, uh, this accounts for deferred execution. This accounts for XS's case where you have, uh, 
and uh, an incubate where in the incubator realm there are pre-compiled uh, modules for a whole bunch of sources, not all of which are in the working set of the entry point module, and you need to be able to construct a new compartment that uses one of those things that's in the ROM, but not entrained by the main compartment. Um, and then, uh, and I believe that's harmonious. I believe that 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 this is one of those use cases where XS needs it in, in one way, and and deferred execution needs it for another reason as well. Um, so this is this is very well motivated. Um, and then being able to link a module exports namespace from, which is to say, if you were to import a, a powerful module from the host compartment, you need to be able to bequeath or endow that to a child compartment without. Uh, without necessarily even having an intermediate static module record um, to use as the basis to construct it. And it's basically sharing instances using the namespace as, uh, as a handle on an instance from another place, another compartment. And then an arbitrary object from which to generate a module exports namespace, which is one of those interesting cases where this might not need to be, um, not might not need to have a special descriptor because we, because it would just be a convenience around another way to do the same thing that might also have lower performance. So there's some trade-offs in how to express this. That in a nutshell is all of the different kind of linkage um, that needs to be supported. Whether to do so with module descriptors, I think is um, a, a point of potential simplification for the proposal. Um, so static module record as termed currently, um, this would be an internal spec name, to be clear, um, uh, that, that we would have to, uh, that I recommend reifying by a different name. Uh, has a constructor in terms of the source. The compilation of the source produces an array of bindings. The shape of the bindings is also a point in the, of design that, uh, that uh, Jack Works in particular has made alternate recommendations for, um, and then expresses where it needs the import it needs a dynamic import and whether it needs an import meta in order to run, which uh, allows for some optimizations. <clears throat> and we've decided, uh, I, I, the, the consensus in the small group of champions is that making these opt in instead of opt out is better. You turn these on in order to induce the compartment to provide them when it constructs the thing. And if it needs them and, and the compartment does not provide them, then that is an error. Um, so a virtual static module record is very similar to the static module record, except that it does not have a reified type and plain, and, or it is a protocol that would, in the spec text, it would be manifested as a protocol where an arbitrary object would be usable in place of a um, module source record or by any other name. Um, and it largely is the same signature. It expresses its binding statically. It expresses whether it needs an import, uh, a dynamic import function or uh, an import meta and then provides an initialize function, which receives a reification of the module environment record by whatever name, um, and then the dynamic import and import meta if it requested them. Um, <clears throat> and we'll talk more about what this looks like if we pivot um, uh, in, into a world where, um, where uh, module instance objects are reified in JavaScript as well. It's, very much in the same theme, but slightly different shape. Um, bindings, uh, this is the current, uh, if all pull requests land, this would be what it would look like today um, in the specification to say that basically these are all, these are the four, the, the four kinds of bindings that are sufficient to express all of the different kinds of important export syntax that are expressible today in ESM. Um, and it seems like we have loose consensus, at least including um, from Peter, uh, not Peter, but from Patrick uh, around using this form to express import star. Uh, using the string star turns out to not be viable because um, star is a valid name um, that collides with the syntax. Um, and it collides with the syntax, but can be uncollided by quoting the string star. Um, and then uh, optional detached global. Okay, so this is this is the part where I come begging. <laughs> it's like if we 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 could separate. Like there there is a full module loader API that 
could be landed into the specification that uh, would be sufficient for every use case except for hardened JavaScript. For hardened JavaScript, we would need to continue to re-implement the entire loader API in a shim until we also had the ability to detach the global and provide an alternate global for the instances of modules. This is to say, we would need we need to write uh, we need to be able to either through the compartment API or other means say here is a new a, here's a reification of a new global environment record and this is the, the import dynamic import behavior associated with it and uh, please construct for me a global that at least and possibly only has a binding for global this and um, and bound versions of all of the uh, uh, bound versions of the uh, evaluators bound to this global environment such that say eval in that global environment goes back to this global environment um and then we can talk about uh, th th this i find to be the, the the least interesting piece but um how to layer uh the compartment proposal in relationship to other proposals uh this i think is actually this slide is extremely stale and will not make it to next week the the situation having had conversations with the folks who are doing module blocks and fragments uh namely nicolo surma and daniel ehrenberg um it looks like there might be a harmonious way for module blocks and fragments to land ahead of uh, compartments provided that we have agreement beforehand about what module blocks, the module block value represents when compartments or module loaders of any kind land. Um, and it looks very much like uh, module blocks correspond either to module descriptors or module instances at this point. I'm kind of leaning toward module instance. Um, because it needs to close over the referrer in order for it to be portable to another worker. And that is the motivating use case for. That's, that's much less than a module instance. A module instance is linked and initialized. And not necessarily that's, um, we can, yeah, we can discuss that more. The, when you I talk. Think you need, I think you need another category if you're trying to, and the category corresponds to one of the descriptors we've, we've already talked about. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Descriptor, a descriptor would be sufficient provided the descriptors land in the compartments proposal. Yeah. Uh, the, which, and and, and that's, a, that's also raises another issue which um, I wanted to just say out loud for the recording, uh, which is I think it would be a terrible mistake to let any of these other things land ahead of compartments because compartments is the harmonizer among them. Uh, and if any of these land ahead of compartments, then we potentially have created a, a problem that can prevent harmonization. Yeah, I, I share that concern. Um, yeah, and I share that concern and also, yeah. Yeah, so again, the layering is a complicated one and not just uh, a, if we achieve harmony between among the proposals before any of them land, then I think that is sufficient. Uh, like once if a harmony is achieved first, <laughs> then any, in my opinion, they can land in any order. And I think that that is perhaps. Um, what, do, what do we mean land? Uh, I'd advance in the staging process. Which stage are we talking about? Uh, let's say, let's say for purposes of argument going from, well, <laughs> I suppose that's, so that's tricky because I'm talking about going from one to two for compartments. Um, I think that module blocks and fragments are already well in advance. Okay. I absolutely do not think anything should go to stage three until all of these things are at stage two and harmony has been achieved. That brings up an interesting question. Anybody remember the URL?
Oh, they have JS as if that were necessary. <laughs> uh, they are at stage. Stage is not uttered any. Okay, they're at two. Okay, yeah, they got to remain at two until all of us are at two and we have harmony. Okay, so where are we with the compartments proposal? Um, for for those just tuning in, uh, I in the last a couple of weeks ago, before and in advance of the first, um, in a, in advance of the first call on this topic of uh, module harmony at TC thirty nine, um, in order for us to have bedrock for conversations, I landed. Uh, a simplification of the compartments proposal that focuses on the aspect of it that pertains to module loading, <coughs> which, um, which is largely based off of, um, which is uh, based not off of the implementation reality of either the session or XS, but based off of uh, conversations with Modable about what the next, uh, what the next iteration ought to be for both. In order to for um, for for the folks working on both sides to have something and uh, a target that we can both approach, um, and uh, which is this new sketch, you'll uh, some some of which needs to change in response to feedback, and I'll we'll go over the pull requests the the pull requests, but it establishes some terminology which also might need to change, <laughs> definitely needs to change, but at least it where it gives us a a. a uh, a view with all of the entities that are um, in play. So module bindings are captured here. We make a nod to the existence of reified module environment records and exports namespaces uh, without saying anything about their shape because those are defined by the bindings. Um, and then I introduce the notion of a synthetic static module record borrowing from feedback from, uh, from Guy that there's an existing concept in the spec for uh, synthetics. I am not entirely certain that it corresponds to this. Uh, it has it has to do with JSON, but I don't think it has to do with. Uh, I, I'm so I'm going what, to propose. I, I, I don't understand the adjective. What is synthetic supposed to mean in this context? Uh, that it is not an ECMAScript module. It is something that is fabricated in user code to emulate a module, a static module record. Um, I think I that see. the name. I think it actually works, but. Um, that virtual is probably better because um, we're talking about host virtualization. This would be the virtual yeah. of, um, yeah. Oh, anyhow, that, but, I think but, I think I think neither is quite because it's not really emulating a source text module record. It's just instantiating the, or it's just you know a concrete. Um, implementation of the common supertype. But the common supertype, which is why it was suggesting just the name static module record should be the common supertype, uh, is does not have all the behavior of a source text module record. Except that it might. One of the things that changed in this revision of the proposal is the introduction of a reified module environment record which actually does allow for the existence of a third party static module record, a synthetic third party virtual, whatever name, non-JavaScript binding, bindings to a non-JavaScript language that does actually support live bindings provided. Uh, <laughs> all this is, uh way too complicated uh, to reason about it. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me that we go at this level of control. Um, but that's just a side note. So we'll, we'll, I hope that we can we'll get down and, and, and do the minimum thing that we want, that, that we need in order for users to be able to do all this and use a lot. It, the, my argument is that this is extremely close to the minimum. Um, the I, with, 
of course, mm -hmm. there is a lower minimum if we do not support WASM or JSON or any other module system in the virtualization. Okay, so so WASM and JSON, none of the nothing other than JavaScript has any need for live bindings. So I, I definitely do not want to introduce any significant complexity to support live bindings beyond JavaScript. I think I think of live bindings the way I think of ECMAScript three. Or, or sloppy mode. I'm sorry, the way I think of sloppy mode as a compatibility mode for ECMAScript 3, where ECMAScript 3 was a mistake and sloppy mode is just a way to support the mistake. Um, so there was a previous version of this API that we ran by Modable and Modable responded to that by suggesting that this API was a simplification from the purpose, from the perspective of a native implementer. I see. So, um, is... so, so I let, I, this, this makes another case for the, the word simple as an arrow that points in a particular direction is not actually a useful word. Oh, well, it's, it's not a scalar. It's a useful word, but as you say, it's multidimensional. Yes. Um, There, there is no version of this API that does not provide an object that allows a third party to assign and read the bound val uh, the bound values to other modules and its own self. Um, it it happens that the environment record is something that already exists in the specification and implementation that is relatively straightforward to reify, um, and that is, I think, the reason why. Uh, Patrick recommended this API. Okay, so it's not that we're paying a, it's not that we're necessarily paying a complexity cost, at least along this complexity dimension in order to support live bindings. That's the argument you're making, is that even if we really don't care about live bindings beyond JavaScript, uh, this would still be at least along one, one dimension simpler and not egregiously more complicated along the other dimensions. That's right. Yeah, no, I think, um, so, um, so I think Patrick is correct in the sense that you, you need to have a, a environment record. And the, my mental model there is related to uh, the, the fact that you can re-export from another module and the mechanics of the re-export, basically if you do export asterisk from foo, and foo happens to be one of the synthetic modules of some sort, um, the way that the importer uh, works there is just that uh, there will be um, whoever is importing from this new module that exports everything from another module, you never go through that module. You go straight into, the last one, uh, yes. one that exports the thing. Um, and there is a component there about reading from the environment record of that other thing. So there might be something in, in between there, but uh, again, like all this is- Yes, me, like, yeah, yeah. Well, let, let me break it down to you why I believe that this is actually quite simple. One of the, one of the really neat things about this is that you can imagine that there is a pure function. There is a pure function that receives as its input uh, a bindings array, not source, a bindings array, and returns an entangled pair of a module exports namespace object and a module environment by whatever name. And this covers every single type of binding that is possible. Every, every kind of binding can be expressed as the relationship between the environment record, the exports namespace object, and the, um, and the entities that it's linked to. But so, so, so in particular, the, 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 comp, the comp, comp complicated case you mentioned is the export star from module, right? In that particular case, there is nothing reified on the environment record. 
basically the linkage bypasses the environment record directly to the exports namespace object. And that's beautiful because that's exactly how it works um, in the spec as written, right? Um, that, that you have this entangled pair and then all of the linkage. Ah. And, and, and the environment record reflects that. And, and, and this pair allows for all the expression of all of the different kinds of bindings in a very clear way. Um, like in, no, but in the, just we should be, be clear in the environment record of the module that re export, there's nothing about those bindings. That's right. It doesn't exist. It's it just, doesn't exist. Yeah. So whoever is importing from it will get that information saying, this is not coming from this module. It's coming from this other module. Let me go and get it from the other module directly. Yes. Yes, exactly. So let, let's test this against the WASM case. Um, uh, the WASM case is interesting because the exports are values, not locations, but they don't exist. Those values don't exist until after the import values have been provided and the module has been initialized. Mm -hmm. Okay, is, is what we're saying all consistent with that? I, let me give that a big maybe and ask that maybe we get <laughs> a WASM expert on this call again. The, um, but let me, let me work through that. Uh, the trick with WASM is that you uh, is is like so many other things. It's a it's one of those cases where um, you, uh, cycles are not supported, so you don't need to support them. Correct. Um, which means that upon the initialization, upon the initialization of a WASM module, after the initialization of the WASM module, we're guaranteed that they provide an object that contains all of its exports as properties. Is that correct? That is correct. Which means that you could then copy them from that object onto the environment record. Ah, yes. So yes, I think it's consistent. Okay, good. It's not live, uh, whether that was some or whatever it is, if it is not live, it's just fine. You just copy over and that's it. We end of the story. Yes. Okay, good. Um, another, another, just, just for explicit, explicitness, um, the beauty of the bindings array is that it also accounts for all of the as directives. So if you say import X as Y, um, or pardon, X, uh, let's take, if you say export X as Y, that means that your environment record will have a property X and your exports namespace will have a property Y. Yeah. Uh the shim does something peculiar to support live bindings. This whole thing about registering, you know, the hidden registration of callbacks and the proxy trap and all that crazy stuff. Um, and it was kind of a uniquely good solution with regard to a lot of engineering constraints the shim was trying to meet. Uh, can we still do that as an implementation technique while supporting the new API? Um, yes, yes, we can. Um, there are two things we could do. If we, if we provide, if we were able to create a fully fledged, uh, if in the shim, we were able to, to actually generate a, uh, an environment record, the, uh, the change would be that the notifiers would be setting properties of the environment record, I believe. Um, yeah, I think that this ends up being equivalent one way or another. And if we implemented, if we decided to implement the, uh, the source to program transform in such a way that um, bound variables were rewritten to binding uh, to, to property access or mutation on the environment object, then we would be able to support live bindings that way too. So it's important that the shim not do that rewrite. Yes, um, if in, in that case, it ends up being a notifier that, ha that effectively is um, okay. moving the property. As with the current shim. As with the current, yeah. 
Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so the more I, I, I drill down on these, uh, obviously, it's talking about the compartment API here, and the more I drill into it, the more I believe that we have to focus back on what the compartment is, what are the, what are the core functionalities of the compartment beyond module loading and constructing a module graph. I, 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 aside from the conversation that I have with Chris uh, throughout this week and last week, I, I feel that the, the compartment API will not have anything about module. Um, and, and we'll end up having a, a lot more simple mechanics just for the compartments, for the core features of the compartment. And then the module will be just a separate thing, a thing that the user will have to control somehow. So I, I, I can I, show that sketch. Okay, yeah, because I don't understand that at all. Yeah, I can show that sketch. But base, what, what I, it doesn't simplify as much as it sounds like, <laughs> because a lot of the same pieces exist in both proposals. Um, but we, 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 we can talk. I, I, there is a way to get everything we want from module loaders in order to, uh, such, such that I could provably construct the compartment API out of smaller pieces uh, without having a compartment object added to the language. If, um if we uh if we instead provide still the, the the static module record constructor by any name and still will smell as sweet um and then also reify the module instance and re reify a module instance constructor which is a pull request i'd like to look at today too but um well let, so let me race through this so that we can get to alternate views. And my, I, the way I like to look at alternate views of this is that I know, and we know from having vetted the shim and vetted the compartments API in excess, that this is set, that this, that this API is sufficient. Um, so I like to look at all of the alternative views as transforms of this into other forms and what can be left behind safely and still maintain the possibility of implementing everything that we need. Um, and like, so the names can change. That's one transform. <laughs> the, the, the features can be added or removed. That's another transform that allows us to incrementally evaluate whether we have strayed too far from a working proposal. Um, so yeah, static module record is a thing that creates something that's very much like a synthetic static module record. There's a possibility it could even be just that it could be the, the, an object that, it, that the protocol is involved with so that we don't have to specify, um, uh, so that we don't have to specify uh, a brand check. If we can avoid a brand check, I think that would be good. And that is to say that if ESM and synthetic module records were, were both operating on in terms of a protocol, that might be a good thing, um, might not work. That's worth thinking about, but it's just take source. Here's an array of bindings for reflection purpose. And then the compartment takes care of it. Um, module descriptors, I think I talked about in the slide. I do not think that this is fully baked yet, so I'm not going to go into it deeply, but suffice it to say there's a union of descriptive types that would cover all of the motivating use cases for compartment, for module to module linkage through compartments. Um, and this is the bulk of the weight of the proposal at this point, um, and most likely to meet litigation. Um, the compartment constructor options are pretty simple, but the, the, the crux of it is how are we going to switch between the mode that everybody else cares about that does not involve a new global versus the mode that we care about for hardened JavaScript that requires a detached global? Um, there are some on, I, uh, there's an open pull request discussing the variations on that idea um, with the hope of getting a vote, uh, an, a, a temperature check, at least from the champions so that I can go forth 
and make a pull request that makes this consistent with whatever we want to do as a group. I suggest we don't use the term detached because that has strong web meanings. Sure. Um, I don't like borrow. We're in the need of a name. Uh, I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, yeah, and then apart from that, resolve hook, modules, load hook. Uh, we have an open PR to remove the import meta hook, which we have discovered is completely superfluous. The load hook uh, provides all of the behavior. Provided that a load hook can return a module descriptor, we do not need an import meta hook. The load hook can make all of the decisions about what goes in meta. Um, and then the compartment is a sort of orchestrator object that main, that exists almost entirely to maintain the invariant that within a graph of compartments, um, that there's only one instance of a module for, uh, and, and the dynamic import and static import both um, produce the same, uh, that pr consistently provide the same results for the same um, module key. Um, and it implements in load and import and, um, and then some other things that uh, TC53 requires that may or may not need litigation at TC39. Um, and then I talk about design rationales, a section that I intend to greatly expand as we get closer to um, having conversations with other folks so that we don't retread a lot of the same ground. Um, and that's that's the entirety of the proposal as written. Um, and then I guess next time we meet, which will be after uh, our, our next conversation with Module Harmony, uh, we get an opportunity to look over the pull requests. One of them is the rename. Um, there are three possibilities. We call it a loader, we call it a compartment, well, four. We call it something else with a name we haven't found yet, or we don't name that object at all, which is attractive to me because this conversation is boring. <laughs> but uh, suffice it to say, both Mozilla and Node have things called, well, uh, Mozilla has a thing called a compartment internally, which means that they are have a soft request that it not be called compartment. That is to say that we can have a co coherent proposal that just makes a whole lot of work for one browser vendor. That would suck. I would, I would argue that we should not go through the pull request until we get through the uh, simplification exercise. I agree. It might be that most of these would, would just be like, just close it out. This could be useless work. The other framing is that loader is also thing in node, but that's also a soft requirement because it's a, a name inside of a module and it isn't a, it wouldn't collide, um, I think, and I need to verify. And it's also experimental. So there's a possibility that they get to change and use our API instead. Um, guest shares host by default. Um, that This is a whole bunch of design considerations about what is the relationship between a host and a guest's uh, import hooks and resolver hooks and, and memos. And it's a little bit hairy. I haven't figured it out entirely yet. Um, reifying the module instance. This is the simplification that Guy proposed at plenary that Carity is also proposing with, and then that just needs some massaging in order to continue to work. This proposal basically says, hey, how about not implementing the compartment object? I say, yeah, we can make that work, provided that vendors are okay with uh, reifying the module instance object. The downside is that host virtualization hooks become responsible for maintaining an invariant that currently is maintained by host defined hooks. Um, I think personally that that is okay, um, but uh, and and also probably consistent with what happens with module fragments and, and blocks. Um, the upside of it is that we don't have to specify compartment, but in order to get all the way to hardened JavaScript, you need to have instead of compartment an object to instantiate a new global environment in which mod to which module instances can be bound. Um, and that global environment notably also would need an import hook because there is a dynamic import available within scripts. So it's coherent. It doesn't actually remove all that much from the specification. It does remove the need to specify module descriptors. It does remove the need to um, have, uh, it, it moves the need to define resolution behavior and the module maps to user code. Um, the way I see it is like the, the current compartment API 
to implement the master puppet or puppet master. And the simplification exercise will remove that um, as a specified behavior into user land. So the user land has to implement the puppet master. And, and uh, as a result of that, they can build a whatever module graph they want and operate on that module graph. Um, so that's the way I see it. Like it's so, and I will add to your case that it is probably easier to implement hot module replacement in terms of the more atomic API. Um, so th this, I think, is going to be the crux of the conversation next week with uh, the module harmony group, because I think it's easier to make a module harmony conversation in terms of the more primitive APIs, since those correspond closely to what blocks and fragments might correspond to. So one, one thing that you said a few minutes ago, you were saying that you need to you need to have the API to create the globals. And then you were saying that two globals will have to can share the same module intents. Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry. Uh, I don't follow. When when you were talking about um, having the low level APIs to build the module graph and yada yada, you also need to have a way to create a, a global object. Mm -hmm. uh, and this global object will be able to basically create multiple global objects off of a, a, a single realm, I suspect. Yes, yes. Uh, each of these uh, global objects will be able to access the same instance of the module because they belong to the same realm. That it is possible to construct a global object that has an import hook that would grant different globals access to the same modules, yes. And that is necessary. Wait, 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 the, the okay, I'm, I'm very confused. The, we're talking about a, a, a global object is, uh, to my mind, just an object with, with explicit properties. It doesn't have any special behavior. So what do you mean when you say a global object with, with import hooks? So imagine that the compartment proposal were evaporated down to just an object that has a global this. And within that global this, there's an eval function and uh, module instance constructor, all of which are bound to that global environment, such that any code that's evaluated in script context within that environment gets an import, a dynamic import behavior that is isolated to a particular module graph. So the global environment oh, so doesn't, doesn't just have a global this. It also has unique evaluators that are bound to it and also has a dynamic import behavior associated with it. So I, you're I, saying I, you have a module graph for a global object? I, Not necessarily. Okay, I, I'm, uh, since it's the end of the meeting, I will just note that I am very confused and a very long way from understanding this. Okay. Um, uh, I will make some time to help <laughs> if you Thank have you. any. Um, yeah, and, and then the rest of these are mostly just like, here are some examples of how to use the compartments API as specified in order to make, uh, 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 in order to invite conversations with other stakeholders who are interested in those particular motivating use cases. Um, this is uh, uh, a solution for for th that we've already seen new bindings for that solves the case of import and export star. And then this one uh, is already has consensus with Modable that we can remove the import meta hook. And that's it. Let's talk again. <laughs> See you all soon. <laughs> we're, we're over time. Thank you, Chris. Great, great job as always. Thank you. Much appreciated. I'm going to stop the share and then stop the recording.